I'm Robin Miller Brecker. And I'm Karen Lenzer. Welcome to Seeking Center, the podcast. Join us each week as we have the conversations and we through the spiritual and holistic clutter for you. We'll boil it down to what you need to know now. We're all about total wellness, which to us means building a healthy life on a physical, mental, and spiritual level. We'll talk to the trailblazers who will introduce you to the practices, products, and experiences that may be just what you need to hear about to transform your life. If you're listening to this, it's no accident. Think of this as your seeking center and your place to seek your center. And for even more mega inspo, sign up for Seeking Center, the newsletter at seekingcenter.app. We are beyond honored and excited to introduce you to sound healer Coco T. Bear. I had the privilege of experiencing a sound bath with Coco at Blackberry Mountain in Wallen, Tennessee, and it was transformative after having had several other sound healing experiences. The one with Coco was like nothing I had experienced before. So of course we knew we had to have them on to talk about sound healing, their journey, kundalini yoga, connecting to spirit, and wherever else our souls take us. Let's get going. Hi. Hi, Coco. Hi, Coco. Hi, thank you. Oh my gosh, we're so happy to talk to you. Robin has talked nonstop about you since that trip to Blackberry. You have changed her in her receptivity and her feelings about sound healing. So to meet you now and hear more about your story, I am just so excited. Thank you. I'm really excited to share. I started after meeting Robin, I started listening to the podcast and then she asked me to speak. I could not wait. Sound bathing opened my eyes to a whole new way of feeling meditation. Mm-hmm. But then getting not only skeptics, but people who have a mindset of what sound healing is already, and then getting those groups of people to try it for the first time or try it again and see that maybe it can be a little different. Yes. Can you talk about how you would define sound healing and the term sound bathing or sound bath? Oh, sure. Yeah, yeah. Because like, even the sound bath phrase still gets a lot of raised eyebrows. Sound healing, sound bathing. For me, my elevator pitch is it's the easiest, quickest meditation I've ever done. And I've not met anybody else who says different. One of my favorite things to ask when people are like, oh, I've done sound dating. I'm like, have you found an easier meditation? No. Yeah. It's because it's so easy. That's my elevator pitch about it. But like my little expanded thing is that it's your body's natural reaction to vibrate in harmony. It's what our bodies do. So we're in a tense situation, a tense room. Our body gets tense. If we're in a relaxed situation, if we're at the beach, everybody's listening to the waves, like we're all loose. So what we're doing is we're just bathing. We're surrounding our body with very intentional sounds. And we're letting our body like focus on those sounds. For sometimes 30 minutes, sometimes an hour and a half, sometimes a full overnight experience. So in that time, our body is not regulating itself. It's just attuning to the instruments in the room. So depending on what that practitioner has chosen to bring into the room, sometimes we love it and sometimes we don't like it. Some instruments are just not our favorite. And sometimes we really hope we only hear one thing the whole time. But it's such a simple practice that you're so passive in your regular practice. Let's just call it a level zero sound bath. You're just laying there enjoying it. But what if you want to be in a seated posture where you're really focusing on opening your upper chakras to the energy channel? And what if you want to bring a mudra practice in or a mantra inside your mind throughout the sound bath? Now, all of a sudden, you can support this as a double or triple meditation. And you get some pretty big experience and feelings and emotional shifts, epiphanies, and new ways of practicing. So all of a sudden, some healing becomes a supportive thing that your body is getting to stay in deep meditation for extended periods where we get to heal at a cellular level, not just for moments of time like we do when we dream, when we sleep, we get to experience it for minutes of time. Minutes of healing versus moments of healing is massive. And so then we start getting minutes and moments of clarity in our day-to-day life without even thinking about it. I listened to headphones far too loud as a young child. So a lot of ringing in my ears. And I noticed that through the years of going to sound bad, the ringing doesn't go away, but the quiet between each ring is a lot longer. And so I was like, okay, my body, my ears are something that the medical science says will not heal, will not get better. I'm feeling get better over time, the more I do this. And so it's this very gentle practice that doesn't require anything of you to really do, but I keep seeing big effects in myself and in others. So I've become a massive nerd about it. I'm constantly telling people to go by tuning for it. I, I think I've said this line a million times now. 
I don't sell two day four because I want you to buy them so bad. <laughs> I don't want it to look like I'm trying to make any money on because they're just incredible. I'm not a great business person. So I'm even like, let me teach you how to use them on yourself. You can use them on you. You can teach your loved ones how to use them and use them on your loved ones. It's such an easy way to connect. You place just a tuning fork on your own heart and then your friend is also tuning to the same tone. There's just a lot of cool little things you can do. These instruments that get your body to respond in a meditative way very quick. I'll recall it next to the microphone. Oh, yeah. Love that sound. And what I wanted to ask, just because we're talking about the fact that our bodies are attuning to a certain frequency. Can you talk a little bit about that? Because I think people yeah. listening may not understand why or how everything you're saying is actually working. Cool. Okay, so our nervous system is in constant response, usually in a sympathetic nervous system, that fight or flight. My teacher likes to say everything is vibration, light and vibration. That is perception, light, vibration, perception. And so that vibration of our nervous system is usually a high vibration or high strong. We use music terms in day-to-day -day life and we don't even realize it. And so with this high strong tense kind of tightness, the body is not the release to let go of narrative, of injury, of emotional injury, of physical injury. The body gets stuck in survival mode. So here, we're getting the body not to be tuned to the normal pattern, what I like to call the human doing. And we get to remind the body to let go and be a part of gong and a lot of symphonic gongs tuned to the own tone, reminding us just to come back to nothing come back to everything, come back just to the infinity of the universe. And that big sound is usually enough to knock us out of our normal pattern, get us back into that human being versus human doing. And in that space, our nervous system gets to literally cool out and not be so high strung. So if you have sciatic pain, meditation is far more effective on loosening that up than stretching it. A lot of times stretching will actually inflame a sciatic nerve even more. So like finding a soft, gentle meditation where you can let the whole nervous system settle and those kind of nerve problems start to lose. And it being such an easy practice, Robin, how many sound baths did we do together? We just did the one. Exactly. Even breathwork meditation, which is so powerful, it actually is my foundational practice. Took me three or four private sessions with a coach squeezing on my chest to get me to that place where I could start going into trances and falling into a deep meditative space. You get to do that in sound bathing and tuning for treatments and the first time. You don't even build practice. And so you get to get someone into a meditative state very quickly in their journey. Well, speaking of journey, that's how Robin describes her experience with you in the sound bath that she did down there at Blackberry. So for somebody who's never gone through a sound bath experience, can we just hear yours, Coco? So like part of my training with my teacher, Laura Rose Wagner, a very thoughtful teacher, was she had us build our sound baths thinking about colors, thinking about intentions, thinking about time of day and feeling and moods we were trying to invoke during the And at Blackberry Mountain, it is a resort, a hotel setting. So I like to give a pretty rounded, not too hyper-focused on any one thing sound bath. That way, if the room is 12 people, maybe we find a moment for each person. So with that kind of broader spectrum in mind, I think of it like a full day, a sunrise, a mid-morning, an afternoon, a nap in the afternoon. You get up, you get another little second wind, and then you start winding down for the rest of the day and you really start getting into that brushing your teeth. Winding down is like getting a good book kind of feeling as you're coming up and seated and finding yourself again. So I try to build this full day in my mind so that way I keep track of it like that. Now I, I get to be with a private student who really likes one sound or more than the other. And then we get to really start focusing those sound backs for those people. And those are really fun to do. You can start customizing every little thing with just gentle intention. I'm trying to get my arms around the, exactly what happens. If I walk into a room with 12 people, do I lay down? Kind of depends. Standard setting. So it's like usually a yoga studio, something like that. Hopefully I've been able to set up some nice soft pillows and blankets on the ground. If I'm not able to, maybe you've brought your own pillow blanket. 
But the idea is that we're building not just a place to sit still, but a place to really melt, release, like a little nap spot. In the South, we call it a pallet, build a pallet on the floor. So maybe you use the yoga props, maybe you just throw a blanket on a couch, but you really just make yourself a nice soft spot. It usually smells as if maybe I have burned sage, but I try to do it like 20, 30 minutes before anybody walks in because we get some smoke sensitivity. And <laughs> I usually like to break down the instruments. I like to show everybody what all the instruments look and sound like. So that way when we're in it, we don't have to do any peeking. And I just try to set too many expectations because you never know what the body is going to do in a sound bath. But then after getting everybody mentally ready, get them physically comfortable. And then in that, try to get them breathing. It's just a guided meditation at the top, really, with some chimes and tuning forks playing underneath. But even the chimes and tuning forks are secretly getting into your body and already opening you up at a musculature level. So we're trying to just get your body to open. I'll guide the breath. So like breathe in together, hold, exhale together. And what that does too is like now you get to bring a whole room not only breathing together, but when we breathe in rhythm, our hearts beat in rhythm. So even in just that soft space we can get everybody vibrating out of that circulatory level and so from that level like from that kind of gentle softness we start bringing in instruments that really remind the body to just let go and then you also i remember were singing or chanting at the end too yes mantra is a big part of my practice as well i love bringing in protective mantra as well yeah at the end i'm going to sing mantra bring in this which leads us right into this some kundalini stuff i found this yoga practice that was so weird that i was very intrigued not weird huh weird oh and at one point the teacher was like get up and dance and i put on like a world dance jam and i was like okay i went around the room and then she was like close your eyes or look down at your mat and dance and I had the best time of my life. And then I lay down and during Shavasana, the gong started playing. I thought I was asleep for hours. And then I eventually kept going back to this Kundalini. It was always different. It's not vinyasa where there's a flow. Sometimes you're just like laying on your back laughing, but then you get up real quick and start doing essentially burpees. What would you say is the reason it's so different and that you can have those kind of reactions? It's because Kundalini tests the nervous system the same way life does, but it does it in a insular, environment where you're safe, where you're allowed to scream if you want to. You're allowed to stop immediately if you want to. Go into child's pose. You're allowed to feel what it feels like to be taxed and then push a little bit further in a safe environment. And so it was learning how to do that. Feel thing where you start to get a little shaky and you start to get little tears in your eyes. You're not here to cry. For some reason, your tear ducts are filling up. With Kundalini, with breath work, I learned how to start using breath, using my own energy centers to pull that in. It was always different and challenging. And then afterwards, you also just felt so euphoric because there was this mantra, there was this chanting, there was this breath and group, there was gong. And so all these things wrapped up where I was like, this is my jam. But at the same time, so many people get so into Kundalini yoga. And I say this as a level one trained Kundalini yoga teacher, I Googled the phrase, is Kundalini a cult 30 times? People get so into it. You're so into it that like you start wearing different outfits and you start going by a different name and you're like, but at the same time, at no point is KRI asking for any amount of your money. Never are they telling you you have to move to New Mexico. People do talk about moving to New Mexico. Like they'll say high elevation and dry. I don't, I'm not trying to have nosebleeds. Thank you though. (laughs) And that's the nice thing. It's like, you're not going to be kicked out of the Kundalini world just because you don't go full. You don't have to like become a Sikh to really enjoy and use this powerful tool of connecting deeply to yourself and therefore feeling that connection to Shunya, to the central channel, to the ever-present generating, organizing, and destroying force of the universe. It feels like another tool, just like a resource to your higher self, to spirit, to the universe, which is also how you use, I think, sound and instruments and your voice. And as you just said, also your breath. Yeah, Yeah, it's like one of another set of tools. Like we all need more than just one thing. We all need kind of a broad support system. And you do this so often for, I'm sure for a lot of people who've never experienced a sound bath or any of this. What are some of the things that people say to you afterwards? Oh man, one of my favorites is, hey, I saw colors the whole time. It's only they get this synesthetic experience where sound and color start to mix in their brain. 
colors start to be inspired by the sound. And then I have a friend who is synesthetic. He sees colors everywhere he looks. He works in banking. So it makes a lot of sense that he's always loved numbers. Because they, some numbers stick out as colors to him. Only found this out because he was like, all of a sudden it went black. He was like, I didn't see anything behind my eyes. He's like, I've never seen that. He was like, and then all of a sudden a face of a gorilla turned into the face of an Apache. What's that mean? So I was like, Wow. I was like, Jordan, you are the most normal person I know, but I think you now have a spirit animal. You're a gorilla. I'm sorry, man. I'm like, you're now a weirdo. I didn't mean to do it to you. But like a lot of people who have never experienced any meditation are like that. So it, it introduces them. Yeah the idea of meditation because they've allowed themselves to at least let themselves feel so many of us have tried hardest version of meditation and that's sitting still and thinking of nothing just watching your breath that is not the easiest meditation (laughs) so a lot of times in your head you're like is this all meditation is when do you think we're done that plate of cookies for everybody over there or (laughs) when do we think we get to eat those if you're not actually doing the meditation, then yeah, you're going to get nothing out of it. But it's not a choice. You've already made the choice to be in the sound bath. So the choices are already done. You're going to physically meditate. Now. And let's talk about too, with some of the instruments that you use, as you were saying earlier, everybody does have a different reaction to a sound bath in general, and probably to certain instruments. I know for me, I believe the gong is a huge release and I'd love for you to talk about that. And I want to just tell everybody that when I walked in to this sound bathing experience with you, I don't get very nervous about a lot of things, but I was really nervous because I had a previous sound bathing, sound healing experience that actually wrecked me a bit. And it really scared me because it did show me when, while I was in it, a darker side of spirit and the universe. And I had to really work after that to regulate myself again and to understand what I hadn't seen and why I had seen it. And so that took me actually several months after the experience. So when I walked in and saw the gong and my friends who were with me saw the gong, they looked at me and they were like, are you going to be okay? And I walked over to you and I told you, and you said to me, oh, you will be more than okay. This is why I got into using the gong because I had a similar experience. Yeah, my gong. So this is my gong angel. She's a 30-inch symphonic gong, like most of Pisces gongs, based on a, it's a zinc disc, and it's hand-hammered. It's even hand-scored. There's only seven gong masters at Pisces, and so each one of these is very painstakingly made. Now, you'll get a lot of gongs that are like based on, this one is the ohm tone, 136.1 hertz. These gongs have different tunings, different intentions, and then this one being a symphonic gong, being a feminine sound, bringing in all the sounds of the universe. It's my favorite. If you're going to have one gong have a symphonic gong one that covers all the sound but yeah it's a big metal disc physically so people get very excited and they want to like ring that bell and so that's what they get used to and they start building what i like to call the sizzle of a gong and it does it feels sizzly in the ears and sometimes it overwhelms you in the chest physically that some people will hear an instrument and think i need to play it at 11 but a lot of instruments are really great down in that five to six It can be an overwhelming instrument. And it was that sense of being overwhelmed by things. I really inspired me to want to start playing the gong, to be a gong player. The crystal bowls are pretty easy to play softly. But the gong takes a bit of restraint. So even as it just kind of starts to build, you're always just asking the gong to play. You're building up this relationship and letting the sound build off this instrument. together. Not sure if you can hear it. We can hear it. Then it starts to get really complex. You start to get these really high notes that are surprising. But then these big low rumbles are so low and comforting, almost like a weighted blanket of sound. But one thing I will say about the gong versus a tuning fork, or for it versus most other healing instruments, even the bowl or crystal, the gong will show you what it has found. 
the gong is like a proud dog or a proud cat, whichever one you're more apt to. And they're like, hey, I found this garbage inside your nervous system. I wanted to show it to you. But even if we've worked on that, my personal thing, my favorite story, was something I worked on specifically in therapy with my therapist. I was like, why is that coming up? Ali and I have talked about this. And then as soon as I said that, the gong crescendoed, I bawled. And the next time that that thing that was supposed to bother me, because even though I worked on it in therapy, I still saw it on the calendar. That anniversary still came up, right? The next time I was at the end of that day, got home at the end of December 12th. And I was like, oh, whoa, I wasn't on the couch all day. I wasn't stuck at home. I wasn't stuck in the spiral. And then I thought back to that day where the gong showed me that thing I didn't want to look at anymore because it had found something inside me. But without being sizzly, without being rude about it, the gong will still bring it up show you. And so a lot of times in a gong bath, you will feel some like a in yoga, a release, just public yes. cry. Yeah. There's a reason most yoga studios have tissues in them. Because when we do this work, whether it be passive, like receiving the sounds of a gong, you might get those releases. You might get those breakthroughs, we call them in therapy. There's something so sweet about that and a gentle thing that if I'm going to ask people to trust me, a burly, bearded, non-binary, sonic shaman, I'm going to need to make the room soft. I'm going to need to make the sound soft because I'm nearly 300 pounds. If I start clomping around the room, you're going to be kind of worried laying there. But if I'm quietly padding, can barely even hear the feet because the flute is playing over it. So there's all these little just attention to detail things I think I learned in my years of theater, years of improv and putting on production. And from that production side, all of a sudden, I saw those little tweaks that could be made in this meditation world. I found that you could live in the moment, storytelling, make-believe with another adult, coming from your highest sense of... A lot of these people are Ivy League educated in the improv yes, world, yes. and they're, they're just up there doing silly make-believes in a bar. Maybe. But when you come from, this, from your highest self and connect eye to eye and breathe together, you can make scenes that look like they're written by some of the best playwrights in the world. You can touch on truths that philosophers would never even think to dare. In, in the moment, you're in the... You're authentic, too, don't you? I mean, oh, my gosh. That's a whole level, too. At, and most improv training is about being authentic. I remember one time I said something in a scene, and the teacher stopped me. Like, Have you ever actually done that? I'm like, a couple times. They're like, all right. <laughs> but, like, so you called out. You're like, where is this coming from? Is this actually coming from you? And that kind of training is also very important, I think, you know, for a lot of people in their 20s who were told to not listen to their gut feeling. That's right. That's right. So through this play and through this relearning, you get to retrain the brain to be a little bit more open to brand new narratives, be open to new ideas and trying things out a couple times. And just a little bit of forethought about where's your A and where's your B. Connection can be a lot clearer. You can get the point across. That's something that's very helpful. <laughs> Definitely. Uh, Definitely. And getting people to try it again and getting skeptics to accept it. Yeah, for me. And I think the other part too, in addition to experiencing the gong with you, was also the space in which we had the sound bath, right? Because the space and how it feels, as you said earlier, you sage usually 20 to 30 minutes before people come in. I want to make sure that people listening understand how important the integrity of that space is so that when you are experiencing these sounds and this energy, you are in a safe place. And the person who is also conducting it is doing it with intention and with your best interests there. I'm going to borrow a phrase from the world of psychedelic that's very helpful in this kind of world too, because it's set and setting. Oh, set and setting. If you take care of that, yeah. And sometimes you just set expectations. Sometimes you're on a storefront next to a busy road. And so you, you do tell people, you're like, the universe is going to provide some sounds for us. Sounds I cannot make. I can't physically make the sound of a Mack truck. But the universe might decide you need that. So go ahead and let that sound in. And what we get to learn in that lesson, which I, if I could make a perfectly sonic, like soundproof space, like the Integratron and Joshua Tree. If people have never heard of Integratron and Joshua Tree, they should definitely check it out. If you can't make a sonically perfect space, you're going to need to set a little bit of an expectation that you're going to hear something beyond just my child. You might hear someone fall asleep. 
sleep. You might hear someone snore. I will tickle their ear with a feather, I promise. But yeah, sometimes you do your best with set and setting, and sometimes, you know, your best is best laid plans of mice and men are off when you're awake. You know what just occurred to me too about this is that it's the sounds are so universal. You're not dependent on words or language, or it's up to your own interpretation, of course, but you could have people from every country sitting there in that room and they can still experience it. Just seeing the instruments play one-on-one, laying down and being able to hear them and feel them, you don't need to know anything. That's right. Before we keep moving on, I want to make sure when you talked about tuning forks, can you explain what they do and what that means to tune somebody? Oh, I can try. Oh, where's my little Mary Poppins bag? I keep my human tuning book around very often. So when I'm talking about tuning forks, there's a couple different ones that I might be mentioning. Might be talking about your classic tuning fork that you're used to seeing. And these two come together. So this is a C and a C. And because of that, you get to hear an eighth, a full octave interval. You kind of give it some sound and some movement. Now, the reason I use these is because they are the instruments used in Dr. John Bull Yu, the creator of Sonic. They were the same instruments used in his clinical study. Where they just played simple intervals to watch how the body, how the brain reacted in real time. So when I'm playing a seventh interval, you might notice it feels discordant. But it makes the eighth the resolve even sweeter. So you get to just build these little microcosm of juxtaposition of a discomfortable sound or feeling. And then you get to build in that knowledge, that muscle memory that it will resolve. So even in just that gentle training, we get to keep the body in that reminder that a tense moment will not always be tense. And it's so quick and effective, the tuning fork, that it is even suggestive that the osteophonic tuning fork, so one with the little nose on the end, osteophonic bone vibration. But what it lets you do is be in a crowded area, have your tuning fork going, and give yourself a little like bubble of sound. So if you're in a really loud environment, all of a sudden this brings everything down to one sound. Say you have trouble hearing though, so you can use bone vibration, you can use your that bone conduction, I like to call this the tuna corn horn. But like I was saying though, the tuning forks are so powerful that it's suggested not to put these in the exact same space spot more than twice in a 12 hour period. What you're doing with like, so the 128 hertz that I like to use, it's hypothesized that it reminds the body of our heart rate in the womb, 120 to 132 being the average. And it brings the body to this slow spot, reminding the body that when we were a heart rate, a brain, a nervous system, that we can regenerate. So we're here to regenerate. We're here to let go. And I've played this on my joint. When I've had a little arthritis flare up, I've seen a tuning fork bring a miscarriage back to life into an ectopic. So it's not a great thing, but the fact that it brought life back into a clump of cells that had been declared non-viable was very scary for us, me and my student, but also very affirming about how effective these tuning forks are. But we have continued to play them. Her journey is actually in a very good place right now. Fingers crossed and everything's looking really good. But it's the tuning fork. I just keep seeing the tuning fork move not only physical hurt through the body, but even last March, I lost a close friend very suddenly. And I felt myself ask myself, like, oh, do you believe in these tuning forks or not? So I started playing the tuning forks. I was hurting up here in my head. I play the tuning forks around my head. I felt it move into my heart. I played it around my heart. I felt it move into my kidneys. And so I played my iliac points in my hips. And I felt myself digest this grief because of the tuning forks within a matter of a couple hours physically. Now, the mental part was still up to me. I still had to do some journaling, still had to do some work. But I felt it get out of my body because of these tuning forks. Wow. Can you talk about, too, just for people who may not have really paid attention to the term hertz and frequency. Yep. In terms, when we're talking about frequency and the the different sounds and what they make, can you just talk about that for a moment for those 
What, yes. that, what does that mean? First, so if you think of that black and green round graph, when you're measuring hertz that are low hertz, so are, as humans, we can start hearing about 20 hertz, low, and those are real low and wide waves. And well, we can hear up to 20,000 hertz, which is really high. I got, I got a mosquito bug. And so those are going to be very tight, very fast vibrations. So when we're talking about hertz, we're talking about how tight are those sound waves? How fast are those sound waves moving to create that sound? Because sound is pressure moving through a medium, and you can almost visualize that pressure wave looking like that, that zhu, zhu, zhu. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it does. And I'm bringing it up too, because I think if people look into certain frequencies and certain hertz levels can help you get to maybe a more calm place or a happier state. Or so, tones are really incredible. They're, you're going to find those. It was funny when I first saw my hertz solfeggio, I was like, that just sounds, is that one of the scales? It uh -huh. does sound like that. <laughs> like, like a phrygian, solfeggian. So, yeah. The cool thing about video tones is it's really hard to get a digital or a podcastable or an earphoneable sound back. Find an acoustic sounding, moving instrument in a digital source is hard, but what we can do with digital sources very well is tune into one specific frequency, one hertz. So 528, I think is my favorite right now. 792 being a pretty good one too. And these might sound like random numbers, but when you hear them enough, when you play them on your Spotify enough, you start recognizing them. It's really, it's a nice, another easy, supportive way to put sound into your life. It's having those specific tones that sound good to you playing in your space, even if you're not there. You can even just hum to yourself. Self-humming is probably the most active tool I share with people because not only does it feel good, none of us love the sound of our own voice, but if we have a tone that we like to hum, it's not because it sounds good, it's because it feels good. That's your tone. So that's your tone. You can do it whenever you want. If you're a little stuffed up, maybe it's a little different. Like You're going to find your tone and you're going to actively use that as a soothing tool. You just practice that and you can change your own frequency, your own vibration by bringing your tone in whenever you want. Oh, those are great, great tips. I also want to just say for anybody who's interested in the self agio frequencies, because I got hooked on those. I love to meditate to them because they're just, there's something about them. They're so familiar familiar in a way yep. when you hear them. I think I heard somebody say that the root of them is the music of the universe. It's really, those are the original notes um, yeah. before we created notes, but there's just something about them and they're all over YouTube. You can just like literally put your headsets on and just listen to them. A fun rabbit hole to go down with that, especially on YouTube, are cymatics. C-Y-M-A-T-I-C-S, cymatic. Yeah, pneumatic, automatic, C-Y. Using like a physical metal plate, either sand or rice on top. And they are playing these solfeggio tones through. And all of a sudden it's just, so it's like garbled up. Almost like that black and white channel, back when we had channels. And then when they hit the tone, it'll snap to this mandala this beautiful, almost chakra looking shape. So if we can do this to physical things with sound, and we know we can do this to water with sound, and you're full of water, like what do you think your cells are looking like during a sound bath? Ooh, I love that visual. <laughs> wow. That is so we're getting our whole body to snap into these very sacred, geometric, original truth vibrations. And I love that you brought up to the difference between experiencing a sound bath and healing live versus what you can do most of the time at home on your own. And it's going to be, if you're at home alone, I also suggest you use a Bluetooth speaker. You physically let it touch your body to also get into that, that replacement of a thing that you're missing when it's just in your ears. When it's right. just in your ears, it's very cerebral. Or you're asking just yeah. your cochlea to process it. But if you could use some Bluetooth speakers or even like a home theater, make sure it's pushing some air around you. That's good. Yeah. yeah, because that is the thing that I think everybody needs to remember is the sounds are incredible, but it's the vibration that really permeates you when you have the experience. How did you get into this? How did this become... I was your story. I didn't. 
love the academic learning system. I went to the University of Tennessee twice, went to three different community colleges. I really tried to do college. Like that version of life didn't really make sense to me. But going to multiple theaters and doing the, the conservatory training programs and putting on sketch shows with people did. That did interest me. And Chicago is one of the great meccas of comedy with SCTV starting in Toronto, moving to Chicago and Second City kind of being birthed from that. It was always like, it was always fun to walk around in that reverence. I was very engaged all of a sudden. And that's how I also felt when I I discovered meditation and and yoga. I was like, all of a sudden, a very good student again. I was like, ooh, this is fun. I see the results. I feel the results. I just want to keep doing it. I know you talked a bit about kundalini yoga, but was there any of this from when you were younger? How did you get into this whole spiritual and sound healing world? Right around my 28th birthday, I remembered things I had been suppressing since I was about and that was a little hard to process. Did that come through meditation? Like, how did you? No, that came through, it just poured in. Everything just poured in. Years and years of removed memories just came back. Around the 28th year and the masculine brain is when the frontal lobe connects. I think really it was just the circuit finally connecting. Wow. But even these are the things I was hiding from myself were finally exposed. I didn't sleep for three or four days because you're like, what is my reality? Holy moly. Did this happen? Things get confirmed. Things get denied. Trust and relationships start shifting. And I was lost. I didn't know what to do. And I found Pierre DeBar in Chicago, Illinois. It was a body worker, massage therapist, physical therapist, but like a breathwork meditation teacher. And when I met him, he was like, you have four sessions. You can either get like massages or you can come and do the work you're supposed to do. And I was like, whoa, I just got challenged by the shoeless. Because like in Chicago, no one's shoeless. But he's like, over there shoeless I got challenged but okay I was like yeah I'll, I'll do your silly meditation and through that breath work I figured out how to use all this energy that anger is not a bad emotion but a very powerful emotion and so it should be harnessed and focused but like all emotions it shouldn't be tamped down. And so I got to learn how to harness and ride and use energy through breath, thanks to Pierre Debar. And that really opened up my eyes to that I was numbing myself, I was shutting off, I was deflecting all those years of comedy and getting people to laugh where to make sure I never cried. If it got too quiet, it might get too serious, I might have to be truthful. So like even in those times of connection and improv and being open, I was unknowingly still shutting myself off. Now all of a sudden, my comedy was not nearly as funny. Now I'm going through a self-healing journey. I'm going through a self-reckoning of living about my own rules, how to be an adult in the world. Someone even asked me in an improv scene one day, are you just going to live by your father's rules for the rest of your life? And like in a front of an hour full of people, I just walked off the stage. So like it just struck me so hard. Yeah, I don't live by my own rules. I live by a set of rules that someone else set for me when I was a child just to protect me, but not by the rules I set for me. And so like this step into meditation and seeing the physical connection between all living beings, even without the use of psychedelics, which I do think mushrooms have a really good use for helping people mentally. And I started feeling people's emotions versus projecting my emotions upon them. And so because of the breath work and because I started seeing a little bit more, a friend of mine was like, you should try, come to this yoga. And it was a little bit weirder. Everybody, I expected an om at the beginning of class, but instead of an om, it was om namo gurude namo. And I was like, wait, all these people know this random new language? And so it was a little weird. I got into Kundalini. I loved it so much that I kept going and started working at a yoga studio. Found my teacher, who was a very cool, in a world of Kundalini, where people are wearing all white and turban. Lauren is wearing this shirt with like Perrier logo, but it says partier on it. <laughs> That's and a Perrier shirt. <laughs> and like, she's just like, very cool and has like very good taste in music it's like hip and it's not just it wasn't like anything else I had seen and so I, I took her 150 hour training before I was a kundalini yoga teacher I was already a certified soundologist taking her three months training and then 10 more months of her letting me borrow instruments but I finished my training with her I had one tuning for it I was like all right I like literally finished the training the next weekend went to a festival and was offering sound healing I've never gone to festivals my whole life I'm not interested in going to festivals but all of a sudden even with just one little tool I'm going up to strangers talking to strangers they 
saying, like, let me put the studio for it on you. Just listen to how good this sounds. I couldn't even do one for each ear yet. I couldn't even wow. put them in two duty for it. I was just so excited. I'll never, I'll probably never go to a festival again. I don't know how people go to those things. Because it's just uh, not too much. It's too much. Is that why? That's too much energy? Oh, my. But what I, one thing that does strike me, though, because I have gone to those and it's overwhelming, is that there is something tangible about what you do. People can right. actually physically feel and experience. They don't have to try to go there in their mind. It's right there. So right there. When you play a 2D person for somebody, you'll see shoulders drop. You'll see people straighten up naturally. So then from there, how did you end up where you are now at BlackBerry? Mountain. I'm not super sure, Robin. No. I went from teaching weekly classes around LA to a monthly class at a place called like the highest hour for this hotel paired with a dispensary and they did a rooftop pool sound bath with weed. And I, I would meet these people who they're in their 60s. It's the first time they've ever done sound bath or marijuana. And I'm like, you're doing both the right way. Good job. So I went from just doing sound baths around LA and still ding bogging through the studio and doing events because in Los Angeles, everybody has three or four gigs. And I heard this voice in meditation to move back. The voice that takes sound healing to the south. Mm -hmm. I opened my eyes. and I was in this beautiful duplex. I was like, no. You're like, no, I like my life in LA. Sorry, voice of God. Like, <laughs> like, I literally never heard a directive in a meditation. And I was like, nah. And when you tell the universe no, the universe kicks your butt. Yep. My landlady was like, I want my grandson to move in next month. You can stay if you want to. And one of my gig jobs was like, hey, we're not doing Southern California anymore. And so I was like, oh, I'm supposed to move to Tennessee. And so like, after I did that, I, I rented the U-Haul and then I got a couple new followers on Instagram that exact same day. At the time, they were both the manager and director at Blackberry mm -hmm. Farm. And I was like, okay, that's interesting. Let me reach out. They didn't, didn't say anything, but it was that day that we started switching back and forth DM. And then next thing I know, it's September 4th, 2018. And I, I got a brand new gong that I could not afford. I had barely enough money for the down payment and I was like, I'll figure it out. But I took this over to Blackberry Farm and, and did a little sound bath and, and they just started talking about the future of Blackberry Mountain. And I was like, wait, did I get the job? <laughs> like, are we... so, it started out as being, I think, three sound baths a week at 50 minutes. Then we went up to 10 sound baths a week at an hour and 15. Wow. And y'all, I'll be honest, I was, for a year and a half, to do that for full time was very exciting. But also, I'd get home my two days off and would be able to maybe get laundry done. Yeah. Uh, I was doing just so many sound baths. I was just physically getting drained. I wasn't able to take care of myself. So I got down to three days a week at the hotel, but they are still doing, still offering 10 sound baths a week. So to see that program, like what a wonderful place to practice. I feel very fortunate to have been able to really get a big chunk of my, my 10,000 hours. Really focused, hyper focused on small groups. Yeah, I was really learning how big of a difference the nuance can make. Yeah. And also just your connection to spirit, I feel. I know we're all connected to spirit, but I feel you're able to interpret and translate for yourself. And as you said, you're feeling other people's energies. I can feel that from you. Can you just talk about that for a moment and how that developed through all this work? Oh, yeah. So growing up here in East Tennessee, as soon as I got my license, getting into the mountains was a 10 minute endeavor. Just getting your truck and you just drive up, see the river site and just pull off the side of the road. Or maybe you go to a farmer's property and swim in their pond. There's just a lot of mountain time that I spent in my teenage years. And that's really where I, without realizing I was doing that, it's where I learned how to be quiet. It's where I learned how to listen and notice the little tiny details. So without even realizing I was practicing that, I was practicing that language of the rivers and streams before I meant to. So that was one of those secret gifts of growing up just in the South. And then you also grow up in the South, you grow up going to church. You grow up practicing, you grow up practicing connecting to spirit. So that way, when you do feel it, you're like, oh, when it does click, you're like, oh, this is what, now I see what we were talking about. So I'm really glad I had that foundation, especially growing up and finding community and finding out how important and strong the community is, no matter what is bringing that community together. When they do come together, it is always so powerful. 
that it just makes that connection to a higher plane a little easier we really could do it together i was even at a concert last year so I was like are we messing up our alignment by listening to this music so loud i was like actually every single one of us is beating together it's almost as if we're creating a dome of electromagnetic field of both so through vibration we can all connect to the same tune the same frequency and i feel like no matter what but it's not a frequency not a message when it's not a direction there's no intention behind it other than just frequency just getting on the same page that's what we're trying to do that's what sound that's what connection does Love that. uh, that's a great way to put it yeah. and then i like to call them psychic gifts because we never know when we're gonna get them right we say that thing that maybe we're just we think we're being quippy or fun but then someone looks at us and like wait how did you who did yeah. you hear that they're like, oh, no, if I had heard that from someone, I wouldn't even dare say it. I, I, I was a joke. I call it being accidentally psychic. So being open to those quiet moments, those coincidences. <laughs> right, synchronicities. Synchronicities, yes. Yeah. I, I feel like those are another little glimpses of the universe being like, a little, a little sparkle, it's a little twinkle. Yes. You're on the right path, you're on the right way, good job, keep it up. Yes. Those little connective links are also very helpful. Yes. Do you find that you have a lot of them? Oh my God. Yeah. <laughs> I would think so because first of all, you're, I feel like clearing yourself all the time from an energetic perspective and you're keeping yourself at these very clear frequencies. Yes. I try to, and it, what's funny is that I'll, I forget about them. Mm -hmm. I spend all my time talking about them, teaching them making sure people use them. And then I'll go three or four days. I'm like, I mean, like in a pretty just poor attitude. So they're like, come sit with this gong that's across the room. Even talking about the tools as often as I do, I have, I'm constantly practicing forgiving myself for forgetting to use them. What's the difference between the gong and this, the singing bowls? I know they sound different, but... The singing bowl. So the gong and more metal instruments kind of make like a booby sound. It kind of moves out. I wish I had better images for this. Oh, like the expanding foam is how a lot of metal instruments will play. And a bowl, especially the crystal bowl, it's as if the sound goes up and just starts swirling around the top of the room. It's almost as you you can hear a locomotive moving. And so it's that swirliness of the crystal bowl that, at least for me, will send me into an astral plane or out-of-body experiences, very lifted and out. And so, like, when my teacher would have crystal bowls, I would actually put sandbags on each shoulder. So I would, like, strap myself in. That's amazing. I love that visual. That's amazing. It's about the set and setting, right? It's about, like, yeah. okay, like, okay, I better really make sure I stay locked in for this one. Because, yeah, those I found the crystal bowls for me would, like, really... Yes. Now that you say that, I feel like that does happen to me. And then what about the chimes then? I like to say that they are more like, they're here to open up the memory center of the brain. So the creator of these Koshi chimes says that they're tuned to air, water, earth, and fire, which is like fine and everything. But like the earth and the fire have some natural and flat notes, and then the air and the water have more like open hold. So whether your grandma's backyard sounded or your grandma's your backyard sounded. Hopefully at one point we can unlock some part, some kind of memory sound. True, yes. Once we yes. unlock that part of the brain, now we're playing around in there. Like a lullaby. You know how they have the lullaby music? It explains now why it would be so soothing. Yes. To, because it sounds very much like that. Uh, yeah, especially in whole notes those open notes you get natural resolve nothing is going to ever sound discordant like that seventh interval we heard before it's all going to be those more like fifth intervals like a fifth harmony that very popular band or even like, like a, an eight like you have certain intervals that just sound very wholesome and so the chimes are supposed either wholesome at the beginning and then usually minor keys at the end how long is a typical sound bath that you get? Were you saying it's like an hour and a half session? Yeah, usually a half is typical, but we've I've lengthened and I've shortened. I recently, I did one in a, in a living room with a family and they were tucked in. And so as the sound bath ended, because it was 8.30, 9 o'clock at night, I just kind of put on some solfeggio tones. I packed all my instruments up, pet their cat Justin goodbye, and then just slowly walked out the door. Oh my God. 30 minutes later, they sent me a text and they were like, that was amazing. <laughs> Sometimes you're just, you're trying to put people to sleep and just leaving them. Sometimes it's like a morning meditation. I'm going to want to get you up and maybe groove it and move it. And they even have a little dance jam party at the end just to 
get you out of that slow state. Okay, you had your slowness. Let's get back up to Yeah, speed. I love it. Just one other question. When you do the sound bath itself, do you literally tune into the people in the room to let that guide you what instrument to play and how long and what to do? Or is... I actively try not to. So one of the reasons I keep my hair in the top knot is to cover my sun center in the daytime on the top of my head to prevent too much energy from coming in, but also to pull in my antenna. To pull my antenna in, that way I'm not like, receiving what I'm asking the room to release. Interesting. Oh, that so- is good. And it's smart. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I'm so glad you asked that question and that you brought that up. I would never have thought to ask. Right. I never had any idea that your hair on top of your head had that sort of meaning. And then it's also, let's get out of business. Let's work. Everything's up and out of the way. Let's get going. Now when I drive, I like to have my hair down, like just to be a little bit more aware. But it's not like I'm not staying in tune with people in the room. I'm still watching bellies breathe. If people are twisting and moving, I might bring them an extra blanket, or extra pet padding. You never know. So I'm always watching the people. Another teacher and I, we call the babies when they're in the room, little babies, taking care of our little babies. We become that though. I, I believe yeah. that. Yeah. yeah. So when the little babies are there, you got to watch how they breathe. Wow. So, so what has been the best part of doing this work for you, Coco, on your spiritual journey? The best part is so I grew up in the South from Texas originally. So have this connection to this story of the Cherokee. So we moved, because like in Oklahoma and Texas, you have a lot of the reservations down from Oklahoma. And then and when you get to Tennessee, you learn where the Trail of Tears all started. We learn more about the Civil War. And as a kid, I was like upset with these stories. I wanted to learn more. I couldn't learn enough about it. But really, what are you going to do with that knowledge when you're not an academic person? And then so all of a sudden, I have this dawn that's about healing and letting go, not only what is here physically now, but maybe what is residually sticking around from the past. And all of a sudden, I have this tool to go to the places where I know certain things have happened, where people were pushed off their land or sacred land was misused. And I get to go play for those spaces. So coming back home to the South and being able to play for Civil War battle sites and campsites and go to fortresses and villages. I have a friend who has a pontoon boat, so a lot of the Tennessee Valley is flooded to make hydroelectric energy, which is great renewable resource, but a lot of those lands are not underwater. Taking that boat over those lands, playing those gongs. It's been really nice to be able to feel like, especially as a European white descendant person, to be able to feel like I can come back and play in a soothing for that land. One goal being able to then walk the Trail of Tears eventually with the gongs. To walk from Knoxville to Oklahoma in three months journey. That's like the goal right now. So everything's kind of leading towards that. Everything's pushing towards being able to do. This next year, I'm branching out on my own. So I can do more focused private events, take care of the community. Meeting people like, Robin, I, thank God I met you now. All on purpose. I'm going to start moving all over. I'm going to start well, it's, moving it's around. The next evolution of your journey. Right. Coco, this was unbelievable. Like, so grateful that we did meet when we did. Gosh. Yes. And thank you for sharing your journey and all all of your wisdom today because I think that you've opened a lot of people's eyes to a resource they didn't even know was a resource. And now they'll try because just understanding the basics that you've given us today, it's like, I have a different perspective on it as well. Good. Awesome. Thank you. Really. And you gave everybody listening something that they can do as a daily practice, what they can listen to even at home. And now they'll probably go seek out sound bathing and sound healing experiences. Your local yoga studio should at least have one sound healer coming through a month. In general, but they will, someone around has probably got a gong, but you might find if it, if it hurts your ears, you find someone else. That's right. We all have different teachers for what we need. So if it's not for you the first time, give it two more tries. We learned so much today. And you can follow Coco on Instagram at Coco T Bear. That's K O K O T. B-E-A-R. Go follow him. See where he's going to be next. And we hope to have you on again. So thank you. And it's been so fun. We've been laughing the whole time, which always added value for us. (laughs) Yeah, this has been a pleasure. This is really nice. Thank you, Coco. Thank you for having me. I'll see y'all soon. Okay, sounds good. Bye. 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 Bye.